Well, good evening, everybody. So I am one of those individuals for whom it's the first time ever being up here in front of all of you. So thank you so much for being here tonight. So I'm Deidre, and I am a professional dancer. And when I say that, probably right now some things are running through your head. I get a couple stereotypical responses to professional dancer. A response I get commonly is, oh, a professional dancer, do something. <laughs> yeah? And at this point I'm thinking, well, am I supposed to do a triple pirouette? What do you want to see? Well, what are your expectations? And I also find it funny because if I worked in another line of work, like if I was an accountant, you know, you wouldn't say, do something, right? <laughs> do some math right now, really fast. Another thing which I quite like is, oh, you're a professional dancer. That's so awesome. So am I. When I was five, I took a ballet class for like four months. And I think, that's awesome. That's so awesome. But it'd be like if you were a doctor and I said, yeah, when I was a kid, I was so good at operation. <laughs> We're like the same. <laughs> Welcome to You're Up Next, a podcast by Bright Club Ireland that explores what scientists can learn from stand-up comedy. I'm your host, Jessamyn Fairfield, and I'm a physicist, comedian, and chronic interdisciplinary collaborator. In this second season of You're Up Next, we're exploring some important topics through the lenses of science and humor, and today we're talking about art. I'll be speaking with Natasha T. Miller from Science Gallery Detroit and Kate Murray, who works with me on Bright Club Ireland. Is it more important to look for truth in the world or to look for meaning? Is there a difference? Can you have one without the other? That seems like a hard question, so let's save it for later. But something I find interesting about looking for truth and meaning is that we use similar processes for each. Learn what is already known, experiment, be willing and even eager to break with tradition, think outside the confines of what is expected, and finally, discover something new which has importance for everyone. When we're searching for truth, we might call it the scientific method. And when we're searching for meaning, we might call it the artist's way. The current pandemic provides a compelling example of this. We need a cure to the disease. We need strategies for reducing its spread. And fundamentally, we need to save lives and get through this as a society. Science is helping us figure out how the virus works, the truth of this situation, and providing ideas supported by evidence on how to hold out until vaccination is widespread. And art is helping us to get by, stay connected, and understand the meaning of this shared traumatic experience. Both have had missteps, for sure. We talked in our last episode about the messiness of the scientific process, the fact that stepping outside the bounds of knowledge means inevitable failures and mistakes along the path to knowing something new. And of course, the same is true of art. As new art is being made in this singular period, inevitably some will fall flat, and some will shine lights on things we had never considered before. Pointing out similarities between science and art as practices is often a precursor to talking about why science art initiatives are so great. You know, breaking down silos of knowledge and bringing people together in new ways. And they are great. I mean, Bright Club is a science art initiative, combining research and stand-up comedy, and obviously since this podcast is made by Bright Club, you can guess all the positive things I have to say about that. There's even a term for it, STEAM which takes the traditional STEM acronym, science, technology, engineering, math, and it adds an A for art. You know, the metaphors just write themselves. Steam engines, powering a transdisciplinary future. I am 100% sure that someone has started a STEAM initiative called Steampunk, and if they haven't, you can do it yourself. I give you my blessing. But let me ask you this. Are we really putting science and art on an equal footing here if four of the letters in STEAM are about technical disciplines and art is just given one letter? Would it be better if it were STEAMing? Science, technology, engineering, art, mathematics, illustration, music, photography. Okay, I've bungled the acronym a bit now. It's a steaming pile of something, all right. But my point is this. Very often, STEAM initiatives treat art as a servant rather than a partner a tool to gussy up boring technical subjects, rather than an equal in the search for understanding. Even the fact that science art initiatives are so much more common than art science initiatives tells you who thinks they're in charge. So why is it like this? 
I would argue that it has to do with elitism mostly, which can be found in both art and science, but is exacerbated by the fact that we as a society pay more into science than we do into art, even as we invariably turn to art to make sense of our darkest moments. So how do we go about making true art-science partnerships, and how can that bring people together in both truth and meaning? Our first guest is Natasha T. Miller from Science Gallery Detroit. I am from Detroit, Michigan, a Detroit native. I am in the Science Gallery Detroit Community Engagement Manager, so I'm responsible for a lot of our community partnerships. In my spare time, I'm also a professional poet, so I tour the world. I perform poems and uh, write books, but outside of that, my main goal is just uh, community engagement, community activism, and advocate for LGBTQ rights, and uh, that's, that's, that's what I'm here for. That's awesome. Um, I guess maybe the first thing I might ask you is just about kind of your poetic practice, like what led you to that, but then also how it informed, you know, you coming into the sort of science gallery, science engagement world, but like as a performer with such a strong and awesome arts background. I jumped into poetry. I think it was one of those things that was just very natural. It was all, it was just in me. So growing up, I played basketball. I played basketball elementary, middle school, high school. And I remember in my middle school graduation, we were getting our awards from our coach. And on our awards, you know, he would come up with these slogans or these sayings that kind of fit who the player was. And he gave me this award. I, I was one of the best three-point shooters. And he called me The Natural. That's what he put on it. And he was like, um, I don't know if you've ever seen this movie. It's called The Natural. And it was about this baseball player, I guess, who just naturally knew how to play baseball. And I was like in fifth grade. I'd never seen this movie. But that kind of stuck with me, right? I didn't really have much training in basketball And I think that transitioned into poetry. I went to the military for a brief stint. I went to the the Air National Guard, Air Force. And I just, after a while, I just wanted to be kind of in control of my own destiny. I used it as a a form of like discipline. But then I was like, there has to be something else. I was always like into politics and I was also into talking, but I didn't know where where the medium was for me as as a career, right? And then one night I honestly wrote a poem and I wrote that poem. And my friend said, oh, you should go out and perform it. And I went to an open mic and I performed it and it was received well. And I always tell people it was the worst poem I've ever written. I hope that it never shows up on YouTube. I'm happy YouTube wasn't around because I would have been canceled if the poem would have ever been released on YouTube. Right. So uh, so I I, but people received it well for the time. And I just kept performing and I started to do slam poetry. Then I started to connect with other poets from around the world, travel and perform at their venues. They would come to here, travel and perform at my venues, colleges, et cetera. And it kind of went up from there. But I say all that to say, as I was traveling, as I was performing as a poet, I was building community. I was building an audience, but I was also building a community of people who could also create these activist projects to give back to their community communities and also the community of Detroit. So I didn't really have, I would say, a formal background in community engagement, but I knew how to create community. I knew how to get people to rally behind something. I just knew that it was something that I was passionate about. It was something that I was good at. It was something that I was willing to learn and grow in. And then I found myself from poetry in this world of science, in this world of community engagement, that all kind of works together because I bring all of the networks and all of the people that I have, uh, you know, gathered from around the world from the years that I've been performing and now I'm able to use those resources and bring them into the, the world of science gallery and the world of science. I have strong feelings about like how science and art come together in those spaces. But I wonder if you could tell me some of how it's been for you, like bringing artistic practice into a science space and trying to build those kind of engagements. Yeah, I think the um, the example that I like to use is I perform at a lot of econ festivals and I'm friends with a lot of economists from around the world. And what they do is they had never really had poetry in these spaces where they would have all of these large economic conferences. And then one of my friends who, uh, Robert Johnson, who's an economist, he started to bring me to perform at, at the conferences. And every time that we would leave the conference, like he would write me and be like, people were blown away by poetry to the point where he tells the story of one day, some of these big wigs he brought in to talk about uh, economics, they had to follow me doing poetry. And he said that they were really pissed off at him because after I did my poem, 
people started to leave and not listen to the actual panelists, right? And he had to say to them, like, you know, like, I didn't do it on purpose. You know, she was here to enhance the festival. And I think what, what I learned in that space that I've carried over to the science and art world is that economics was the data. It was the numbers. It was people saying, you know, here goes the numbers, here goes the facts. It's very black and white. But you never get to... To, to talk to the people that the data is for and that the data is about. So I always felt like I came to and I humanized those practices and I humanized those conferences and saying that, you know, these are not just the abstract, like we, we are people that make up all of this data that they're talking about. And I feel like when it came to the science and art fusion, it was the same way, you know, science can be very abstract for a lot of people, you know, no matter what type of science it is, you know, especially in inner cities and in the communities that I grew up in, you know, we don't have a lot of sciences. We don't have a lot of, you know, neurology. We don't have people who are just invested in because of the resources, obviously, right. And, and the lack of the pathways to those types of careers. But I felt like we do have a lot of artists. And when it comes to science, there is a science to a lot of the art that people are doing. But also when it comes to science, where you got hard up scientists who are just like, this is my work. These are my findings. This is what it is. I feel like art kind of humbled them in, in that space, in that fusion of art and science. And I also feel like with, with this fusion of art and science, it has made a lot of artists, especially who we bring in through Science Gallery, look at their work uh, differently. Look at their work sometimes in a more mature light. Look at their work in a more advanced light and just think about we're creatives and we think that we're, we're just creating and I go back to being natural and we're creating naturally and we're just going and going and going, but not giving ourselves the credit of like, no, we're scientists too. If you think about the science and the detail that goes into writing and reworking the poem or maybe just being something like a hairstylist or maybe just being a painter or whatever it is, like whatever your medieval art is, uh, there is a science to it. So I feel like, I feel like there's, there, it's a, it's a great relationship because we're helping to, to humble and humanize the sciences. And I feel like the scientists is helping us to mature and recognize how advanced we actually are in our practices. Um, and we don't give ourselves much credit for that. So it is a, it is a perfect marriage to, to me. And, and I have learned a lot, you know, obviously about science that I just never, I never saw myself in, in that space and to never see yourself in a space to actually loving the space and enjoying the space uh, to me shows that it actually is a natural fusion and it is something that we should, uh, that should be at the forefront of a lot of communities. And for me, very specifically, my work as a community engagement manager. Yeah, well, and I think it's so true what you said that like the best science art initiatives like have this kind of two way exchange where like people are learning in both directions and kind of getting something out of the different lenses or different ways of looking at, you know, two different types of creative work effectively, which is really cool. I did a program recently. Um, it's called Grief During a Time of Joy. And what I did was I connected to two different doctors that are at Michigan State University. And these doctors were to come in and they felt like their their job on the panel was to basically discuss, you know, the, the, the science, the data, like what what factually does it like in your brain happens when you're depressed and what, you know, just answer those types of questions. But the panel turned out to be something very different because the doctors, one of them had lost her five year old son and she was in pediatrics. And another one, another one doctor, I think he was a, a neurologist and he talked about how he had a suicide attempt a few years ago. And they felt like that was the most human panel they had ever been on because they were providing all of this data, all of these statistics, all of these numbers about like, okay, this, this is the reason that you feel the way that you feel you're not imagining it. But then they provided this human experience, which is an art within itself, just a human experience of like, no, I dealt with this too. I am like you. And since we had that program here at Science Gallery Detroit, both of those doctors want to do more work with us. They're like, we've never done anything like this before, you know, and the people who were joining the panel, I mean, as the audience, they also thought like, we're about to talk to these doctors about to be this jargon. We really don't understand, but we're very interested in the subject matter, right? So we do want to hear it, but is it all going to go over our head? And then the feedback was like, no, we got the best of, of, of both wor worlds. We got this validation that what I feel scientifically is real. I'm not imagining it, but also these people have really dealt with the thing that I'm that I'm dealing with. And I always think, you know, going back to science and art, 
that is a perfect, you know, marriage. That is a, a, a meaningful relationship. Yeah. I mean, I think that's such a great example, too, because like I know in the public engagement stuff I've been involved with, a lot of times scientists will talk about how like they don't feel like they're allowed to be their full selves in other contexts. And then, you know, like, yeah, coming into an event like what you described, I can just imagine that being so rewarding for people who are kind of experts, but they're also human beings who have experiences. And- we're artists, but like we have to only be human. We have to only be a mess, right? Like you expect <laughs> us to be messy versus that other side of, no, no, no. I'm not just, it's not just feelings. You know, artists like when you, when you, when you look in, in between the lines of the poems and you read one of your favorite artists work, you know, we're throwing some science and some data and some facts in there as well. You just might, and of course, maybe you will catch it the first time around, but you don't know the work that like as poets, like the research that we do. So I'm not just giving you my feelings. We're also educating you, you know, as, as well. So I do feel like that's what it is. You think art is just this messy human being who's just been going through all this trauma their whole life. And then, you know, the science is just we're not human at all we're just here to kind of spit these facts out and when you bring those those two together and we're both you know allowed to be ourselves and each other I think that that's something wonderful to to, to witness yeah absolutely I think too I want to go back to something you were saying before about like art as kind of I mean partly like humanizing science but also like including people that might not have traditionally been included in science spaces right and like I mean, I know for both art and science, it's an issue of like accessibility and like who gets to be involved in those conversations. But do you feel like when they're combined that like there's there's an improvement in inclusion and accessibility or like that it's able to bring in more people than have traditionally been part of those conversations? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I wouldn't give it uh, too much credit, but I think there is a, a little more accessibility in those departments. But I think that no matter what the subject matter is, you know, whether it be science, whether it be art, whether it be refrigerators, it doesn't matter what it is when it comes to accessibility. It depends on the team that you have that are that's creating those accessible pathways. Right. I don't care what what you what you merge together. You know, you have to make sure that you have a plan to to introduce people to it, to educate people on it. But when it comes to accessibility, some people already know the things that not what they need to know to get involved in the actual, uh, let's say, uh, uh, fields, but there's so many people that if you just went and talked to them, you would find out they really just need more resources and they can educate other people and themselves. So I, I don't really know if it's the art and science fusion as much as it is listening to people going into communities where they don't have just the resources. Cause here in Detroit, you know, we're doing an, an upcoming exhibition on uh, surveillance. And I, I have been telling people uh, at science of Detroit, since we came here, we don't have to do it on our own. The people of Detroit are already doing work around surveillance. They're already doing work around water. They're already doing like work on on some some people on global levels. We just need to provide them more, more resources so their platforms can be elevated. When those people in the community, when those platforms are elevated, then they're able to reach more people in their communities who now know, oh, there's a pathway to me becoming this type of thing. And we're just using science and art again as the mediums. But it's really that accessibility can only come from the team that you hire, the team that you work with, and you intentionally in every project and every single thing that you do say, I'm going to go out to these communities that we exist in and I'm going to provide them with the resources, not not look at them as if they don't know anything about science or they don't know anything about art because they do. They just need the resources to to learn more, educate themselves better and educate other people in their community and say, here, here are all the pathways that, that this can lead you to, right? Like in science, you know, this is not one type of science. There's all of these different sciences that you can involve yourself in, right? Now, that's what I mean when you go into schools and it's like, you know, I don't know, I could be a social scientist or a political scientist or, you know, people just think of just, it's just science. You know, they think like, oh, I could be an astrophysicist or they think it's all of that. And it's like, oh, there's all, all these different ways you're already involved in science. I just got to kind of narrow it down and further define it for you. And the same thing with art. Yeah. Amazing. I'm like so well said. Um, I think, I'm sorry, I feel like this whole conversation is just me being like, that was great. I agree. Uh, (laughs) um, But I guess one thing I wanted to ask too, is like, I feel like you put that so well in terms of, you know, providing resources for people and not assuming that they don't know stuff. Um, How does that tie into like advocacy in this space for you? 
Yeah. I mean, that the answer, I think, is is in the question. You know, like I go into these different communities and I assume that people do know stuff. I assume that you know what your problems are. Right. Like as somebody who's black, who's, you know, queer, who's a part of that community. I don't need somebody who's who's white, who's cisgender, who's, you know, telling me what my problems are and telling me what their fixes are. Right? I don't need to do that. Like my advocacy is going into these spaces, assuming that you know exactly what's wrong with you. I can maybe help you find the language to explain it and help you to define it. But you know what it what it feels like. And I can be humble enough to take that and figure out what that language for it is. But then also, again, provide you the resources to advocate for yourself. For me, I can advocate for black women. I can advocate for uh, queer black women. I can't advocate for trans black women, right? I can provide those resources for them. And I, when I say advocate, I mean, I can be an ally, right? Of course, I'm on your side. I'm saying the thing. I'm trying to give you everything that you need to be successful or to just be alive. But I can just hand you the mic and you can advocate for yourself because you know what it is that you are dealing with so my best form of advocacy is saying, I'm in these corporate spaces, but when I when, when we close the doors, I don't need to be telling these people what trans people are dealing with. I need to tell them that I know some trans people who need to be behind closed doors and they tell you exactly what they're dealing with and they tell you exactly what they need. And what I do is I support and say, if they say that's what they need, that's what they need and we need to, to, to make it happen. So I feel like that's a lot of the work that I do here with Science Gallery Detroit is, I'm not giving people a voice. People already have voices, right? And they're probably already using those voices. It's just not enough people listen. So maybe my advocacy looks more like if I'm behind closed doors with the people who have the finances, with the people who have the ability to make the changes, then I need to make sure they are listening because these people are already talking. They just need these people to to be listening. And I think that's that's my work as an advocate for you know anything that I do. We also spoke to Kate Murray, who works in theater and comedy, including on Bright Club Ireland. I am a theater practitioner. I work with Frigoli Theatre Company, and I also work for Bright Club Ireland as the production coordinator. That's great. Those both sound like great jobs. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe let's start out by, by talking about your theater work. Um, and like how, how you got into that, but I know as well, you do a lot of, uh, theater as outreach or theater as ways of connecting with, um, less connected groups. So would you like to tell us about some of that work? I'm really interested in people and I'm really interested in stories and the way in which we can connect with one another and communicate. Um, so that's what my work is about, uh, both as a theater practitioner and with Bright Club. And um, I suppose when I started to work with Fergoli, I was very much about acting and performance and that's what I wanted to do. And I kind of had a single minded focus on that. And it was great for a few years learning and getting that experience of acting. Um, and I was very grateful for that and I learned a lot during that time. But as time went on and I got a little bit older and also at that same time, Maria happened to be just finishing off her studies in um, her social work masters. Uh, and she was also working in a, in a youth centre at the time. And uh, we both began to have discussions and um, it became clear to us that we were both interested as well as the general performance and interacting with an audience um, in, with stories we were telling. We were both interested in maybe considering what we could do with the theatre and the work that we were doing, how it could communicate with the community more actively, how it could spark conversation or maybe how it could engage and, you know, put out our hand to other people in the community and bring them along with us and, and create something. So it kind of for us became maybe a little bit less about the shows and the style and the what theatre festivals we were getting into and maybe over time and to an extent unconsciously, a little bit more about the impact of our work and what we can say with our work and who we can engage with with our work. Yeah, that's great. Um, and you said something about, too, about art having the power to connect people, um, which I think is wonderful. And I agree. <laughs> I don't know. Do you want to just uh, talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, I always come back 
to this this one idea, which is that and everyone, no matter what you are or what you do, everyone is interested in stories and everyone has a story to tell. And ultimately stories, I think, are what connect people. And so everyone's also looking for connection all the time. So I just think that art in any form, it is always offering you the opportunity for connection. And therefore, it's always offering you an opportunity to engage, to learn something new. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And just so well said as well. Um, I, I wonder, because I know obviously through through Bright Club, you've worked at the interface between kind of art and science and, and social science. Like, do you think that um, well, firstly, do you think that that's that's a valuable kind of interface? But also, like, do you think that art that takes on some of the trappings of science or science that takes on some of the trappings of art? Like, what do you think about those kind of initiatives? And do you think that do you know they're done well or poorly? You don't have to say that Bright Club is great on this. It's not a <laughs> this isn't this isn't just a plug. Um, I'm interested to hear sort of your thoughts, especially as, a, as an artistic practitioner. Well, firstly, about working like the the kind of my experience of the science and the art coming together. I mean, that's been just something that offers me the opportunity to listen and to learn from people that I don't necessarily most of the time share a similar background or um, technically on paper. We don't have a lot in common, but actually we have so much in common because we're all human. And, and that's what I suppose Bright Club does is it strips away some of the the titles and the the terminology and and the the thing that can often sometimes act as barriers between people communicating and really engaging and it kind of takes those away and it allows people to just meet each other where they are and so for me that's just been enjoyable and also I think it's really important and in terms of science and and art and I think that just for me science and art just go just absolutely hand in hand together because they're both kind of like wondrous and I think science is like it's kind of magical like it's um some people can find it kind of just amazing like sometimes when I hear the jobs that people have from Bright Club and what their area of research is I'm genuinely like I'm just fascinated because I did not even know that that was something you could research or like how far they've gone in their research with it so for me there's something kind of wondrous kind of magical and the two things kind of go hand in hand what I don't sometimes like is I, I just find sometimes there's a danger that of art becoming subservient to to science and you know I for me they're both important and it should just be they, they become a one and it's um it's not one working to help the other or you know vice versa it's um it's more holistic than that yeah no absolutely though I think that's such a good point that it isn't you know like you said you don't have one subservient to the other and it's not about like appropriating the techniques of one thing to to promote something else It sounds really simple. Listen to what people already know and help provide resources for them to create something. Honestly, that describes community outreach just as well as it describes truly collaborative partnerships between artists and scientists. And that's because listening and helping and creating are not unique to art or science. They are human activities, and they're the very things we use to search for truth and meaning. So thanks for listening, and go out and help create something. This episode was made possible by support from the Community Knowledge Initiative, the Cora Medical Device Research Centre, the Research Office at NUI Galway, and Science Foundation Ireland. We're grateful to our guests, our host, which is me, Jessamyn Fairfield, our producers, Morris and Sean, and to you, our listeners, and our Bright Club Ireland community. A transcript of this episode is available at brightclub.ie, where you can also find more information about what we do at Bright Club Ireland.